the late 18th century, three great voyages of discovery were made, which would push the borders of the British Empire to the ends of the earth. They were led by Captain James Cook. In just over a decade, his genius as a navigator and chart maker would add a third to the map of the known world. For many, he was the greatest explorer in history. For others, a ruthless conqueror. While Cook is famous for what he did, we know much less about who he really was. I'm off on my own voyage of discovery to search for Cook the Man. Travelling in his footsteps, I want to uncover the forces that drove him to success and ultimately to his death. Between 1768 and 1775, James Cook, the obsessive discovering genius, had crossed oceans, charted new lands and discovered new peoples. He had secured his place in history. Like many people, I'd learned about James Cook at school. At first, I really didn't think he was for me. It was just more propaganda for an outmoded empire, the noble hero who discovered Australia and New Zealand and put a lot of the Pacific on the map. But while researching for my book, I learned more about the woman behind the imperial icon, his wife, Elizabeth. In 16 years of marriage, Elizabeth and James spent a total of just four years together. They had six children, and Elizabeth buried all six alone. She survived James by 56 years, but just before she died, age 93, she did something curious. She burned every single letter he'd ever written her. The inner world of James Cook went up in smoke, a hidden world I wanted to explore. My search for James Cook starts here at Whitby on the Yorkshire coast. Here, the 18-year-old former farm boy began his naval career as an apprentice to a Quaker ship owner called John Walker. Captain Cook Society's Cliff Thornton is bringing me to John Walker's house, now the Cook Museum. Here, 18-year-old James undertook not to play dice, cards or bowls, or commit fornication, nor contract matrimony. In return, John Walker agreed to find and provide meat and drink, washing and lodging, and to teach his apprentice the trade, mystery and occupation of a mariner. Now, tell me about the Walker family. Who were they? Well, first and foremost, they were a Quaker family. There was quite a large congregation within Whitby at that time. So that meant that their approach to life was very sober, very industrious. They believed in moderation. So these traits then were Quaker traits, but these surely were also the, the traits that were imbued in James Cook during his time here, do you think? When many captains were, were sailing into foreign lands, blasting away with the cannons to say, we are master, Cook was going very peaceably and trying to establish friends and trade with the peoples. And I think you can trace some of those origins back to his time here. James Cook learnt to sail in the North Sea, some of the most treacherous waters in the world. The ships he learned on were Whitby Cats, the coal tankers of their day. He'll eventually take these strong, versatile ships to the ends of the earth. In June 1755, after nine years learning his trade, Cook joined the Royal Navy. Within two years, he was promoted to ship's master, responsible for navigation. So as ship's master in the mid 18th century, what does Cook have to work with? Well, maps or charts for a start. But the thing we have to understand is that the maps back then were not the more scientific documents we have today. Take a look at this. It's a Newfoundland map that was drawn in 1698. 
looks like an OK map, doesn't it? Now compare it with a satellite image and you can see it's hopelessly inaccurate. But soon, accurate maps would be in huge demand. In 1756, Britain and France began the Seven Years' War. Two years later, 29-year-old Cook was sent to New France as part of a combined army and navy force. Its goal was to make North America British. The French first line of defence was here at Louisbourg Fortress. The British made a surprise landing on nearby Kennington Beach and won the Battle of Louisbourg. But for Cook, the victory was almost a side issue. The day after the, uh, the, uh, the fortress fell, Cook was walking on this little beach where he met a young man named Samuel Holland who was using a strange kind of instrument. As it would turn out, it was called a plain table. The plane table was a revelation to James Cook. He quickly grasped that it could be used to transform the accuracy of naval charts. Let's supposing we place the plane table here, and this is the stone represents the object we're, we're taking a bearing on. Well, if you take a bearing with the plane table on that object, then you measure off a known distance here, then take another bearing on the object. Since you know this distance by geometry, you can calculate what these two distances are. So Cook, Holland, or in fact anyone, could take what they saw before them in the landscape and translate that onto paper. In other words, they could make themselves a map or an accurate chart. James Cook had found his calling. Until now, sailors like him had been reliant on local knowledge, crude sketches, and written lists of sailing directions. Now, as a map maker, he would draw scientific charts, bringing precision where there had been none. We can still see the first chart he ever drew. It's kept here. This is the Hydrographic Office in Taunton in Somerset in England, and it contains charts for every scrap of coastline on Earth. But more importantly, it contains one of the most significant documents for me anywhere in the world. It's kept in the protection of the curator of maps, Philip Clayton Gore. Right, so it's in here, is it? Wow, isn't that just beautiful? It's extraordinary. This is the result of James Cook's meeting with Samuel Holland on that Canadian beach. This is James Cook's first chart, a draft of the bay and harbour at Gaspé on the St Lawrence River. 1758. Cook's maps from Canada were so outstanding that he was appointed King Surveyor of Newfoundland. But what I'm beginning to see is how it suited his perfectionist nature and his passion for accuracy. He, he stands alone for his thoroughness and for his dedication of the application of this emerging science of, of, of hydrography. He's unremitting in his labour. He's al almost verging on the obsessional. Now, here's the map Cook was given in 1762, the year he started charting the territory. If we compare it with the satellite image, it still doesn't match up with reality. OK, here's what Cook produced five years later. Now, this really is a map. Just look at this detail. And when you put it up against a modern satellite image, you can see just how precise it is. So precise, in fact, it was still being used well into the 20th century. Perhaps as he entered his mid-30s, this down-to-earth Yorkshire farm boy had travelled further than the New World. His charting ability made him invaluable to an ever-expanding empire. 
But it also meant he could start climbing Britain's rigid social hierarchy. And there's a clue that he knew it. Take a look at his signature. It's changing. He's adding elaborate flourishes. I think it's the signature of a man growing in confidence, preparing himself for better things. By 1767, James Cook was 39 years old, married with a growing family. His wife Elizabeth was 27, young James four, Nathaniel three, and little Elizabeth 18 months. Life for the Cooks had settled into a pattern. James spent summers surveying Newfoundland, winters back in London finishing his charts. Then one day, Cook was called to the Admiralty, the headquarters of the Royal Navy. The Admiralty wanted Cook to lead Britain's first scientific voyage of discovery. He was to set sail for the very edge of the known world and then go beyond to discover a new and fabled land of riches and claim it for Britain. In the 18th century, at least a third of the Earth was still a mystery. Nobody in Europe knew what was in the blank space to the south. But there was a legend that waiting to be discovered was a great southern continent. There was always the hope of finding another America. The America had made such an impact on European consciousness. And there was the hope that it would bring with it the riches that America had brought to Europe. So why did the power brokers at the Admiralty choose James Cook, who on paper was just a ship's master? Well, it would take a brilliant navigator to find it and a superb map maker to chart it accurately. If it existed, they knew Cook would bring back the information they needed to claim the prized land. The Navy had already chosen his ship. Ironically, she was a Whitby Cat, the very type of ship on which Cook had learned his trade. Her name was the Earl of Pembroke, but it was changed to Endeavour. If you're looking for James Cook, this is probably the best place to find him. This is his ship. This replica of Endeavour was launched in 1993. Hi there, hi Penny. How are you going? Good. On board. Thank you. Okay, it's a bit of a squeeze, so I'll yeah, dump my bag up there. Second officer aboard the Endeavour replica is Penny Keeley. She takes me below decks to the claustrophobic world of the 18th way. century Navy. Captain Cook's lobby and his cabin in here. Now I can imagine there's a few banged heads in here. James Cook was over six foot tall, about six foot two. He had to spend three years cramped in this quarter. After months of painstaking preparation, everything was finally in place. August 26th, 1768. The 2 p.m. got under sail and put to sea, having on board 94 persons, including officers, seamen, gentlemen, and their servants. It was the biggest moment of James Cook's life. If successful, this voyage would propel him towards naval stardom. The day after Endeavour left, Elizabeth gave birth to her fourth child, a boy, Joseph. But within a month, baby Joseph would be dead. It would be three years before James Cook found out. After five months at sea, Endeavour rounded the tip of South America and entered the waters that would make Cook famous, the vast and mysterious Pacific Ocean. Three months later, Cook and his crew arrived at the island of Tahiti. Their intention was to observe a rare astronomical event, the transit of Venus across the face of the sun. But it wasn't this that caught the crew's attention. It's heaven on earth. That's the best posting you've ever got in a brutal navy. Natives were friendly, food was good, native women were even friendlier than the native men, 
and you could have a night of pleasure for the price of an iron nail. So this was just mind-blowing. But for Cook's most eminent travelling companion, Tahiti provided something much more significant. Joseph Banks is a wealthy aristocrat with a passion for natural history. He's paid £10,000 to come on this voyage, but he's really entered into the spirit of things. He's collected hundreds of natural history specimens, and now he collects one more, a young Tahitian named Tupaya. Tupaya was a Tahitian priest. Banks saw him as an exotic souvenir to show off back in London. But here we can get a fascinating insight into the way Cook's mind worked. Tupaya was a navigator, and Cook wanted to tap into his incredible knowledge, knowledge of the mysterious waters of the Pacific. Cook respected his geographical knowledge, his navigational skills, and he was an invaluable translator for them all around Polynesia. But Cook uh, draws upon local experience whenever he can, and I think perhaps that sets him apart again from other officers in the period. His willingness to learn uh, from local knowledge uh, to deal with indigenous peoples. After leaving Tahiti, Tupaya drew Cook a map. Two men, one guardian of the Polynesian world and its geography, the other an officer in His Majesty's Navy. And the common language they shared was that of navigation. Tupaya's knowledge was that of the amazing Polynesian people, the most widely travelled people on Earth. Tupaya's map stretches across some 2,200 kilometres of ocean. But on it, there was no sign of the great southern continent. We cannot find that Tupaya either knows of or has ever heard of a continent or large tract of land. I have no reason to doubt his information. But as instructed, Cook sailed to 40 degrees south and found nothing, no sign of the southern land. So he went back to his secret orders, which said, not having discovered the great southern continent, you are to proceed in search of it to the westward until you discover it, or fall in with the land discovered by Tasman. In 1769, that land looks like this on maps. The Dutch explorer Abel Tasman had named it Statenland in 1642. It was widely believed to be the west coast of the great southern continent. All Cook knew was that he was looking at the east coast of an unidentified land. The quickest way to find out if this was the great continent was to ask the people who clearly lived here, people who were about to make a profound impact on James Cook. This mystery coast is in fact the home of Māori. They call it Eotearoa, the land of the long white cloud. We know it today as New Zealand. Endeavour dropped anchor at what's now Gisborne, about halfway up the North Island. Watching Endeavour arrive was Te Maro. Te Maro was leader of the Nga Te Oni Oni tribe. He'd never meet Cook, because when a landing party was sent ashore from Endeavour, Te Maro was shot dead. Hi, Barney. Nice to meet you. Barney Tupera is Te Maro's descendant. Come on inside. Thank you very much. Barney and the Māori have not forgotten their meeting with Cook. The next day, Cook comes ashore and he writes that he saw an assembling of natives with flourishing weapons above their heads and doing what seemed to be a war dance. It wasn't just a war dance, it was a kapahaka. Cook was probably the first Englishman to witness a Māori haka. The haka that Cook saw would have been an expression of aggression, would have been an expression of celebration, but also of prowess and strength. 
Cook had no idea how to respond to this Maori haka, but what happened next was remarkable. Te Rako, who was the leader of the kapahaka that came down onto the beach that day, would have then gone forward to meet him. What the Hongi is, it's a way that we as Māori greet people, irrespective of whether we like them or not. It's quite an intimate, but very gentle and friendly way of greeting another person. Cook's instinctive response brought the dangerous situation under control. But that bridging of two diverse cultures was all too brief, and things soon began to go wrong. For a reason unclear, Tirakau grabbed Cook's sword. And then, of course, as we know, he was shot. From the British accounts, there is the story that Cook placed a red coat from one of the Marines over Tiraco's body. Is that something that is picked up in your oral history as perhaps a gesture of reconciliation? To some extent, it's probably fair to say that with the laying of the red coat, there was a desire to accept that maybe what happened shouldn't have happened and Cook taking responsibility. I am aware that most humane men who have not experienced things of this nature will censure my conduct in firing upon the people. But I was not to stand still and suffer either myself or those that were with me to be knocked on the head. James Cook knew that his time here had been a disaster. He called it Poverty Bay. I think he named this place as much for his own sense of failure as for any failure in getting provisions. Cook sailed north looking for supplies and safe anchorage. He had to find a way to communicate with the inhabitants to get what he needed and to find out if this was the great southern continent. But he knew he must tread carefully. So next time they went ashore, he sent in Tupaya, the Polynesian navigator. They set in at a place called Tolaga Bay. Endeavour anchored just over there, then Cook rode around this headland and came into this cove here to get wood and water. After his disturbing first few days in New Zealand, he's learning that respect goes a long way with Māori. During our stay in this bay, we had everyday traffic with the natives. I suffered everyone to purchase whatever they pleased without limitation, for by this means I knew that the natives would not only sell, but also get a good price for everything they brought. We know from his journals that Cook was deeply worried about the effects his contact would have on the indigenous people in the Pacific. What seems to be happening here is much more than just an explorer plotting a stretch of coastline on the map. What we're seeing are the moral coordinates in the growing map of Cook the Man. Cook suspected that this was an island and not the great continent. For the next six months, he minutely charted what turned out to be the two islands that we now know make up New Zealand, and he claimed them for Britain. His final map is a masterpiece. This is just the most brilliant piece of hydrographic work ever undertaken. It's pioneering, it's on the grandest scale, it's done in the shortest space of time, and it's remarkably accurate. Nobody had ever done anything like this before. By April 1770, Cook hadn't seen his family in over 18 months. He'd missed James's seventh birthday, Nathaniel's sixth, and little Elizabeth's third. He thought he'd missed baby Joseph's first birthday. He had no way of knowing that Joseph had died a month after he'd left England, and it would be another 15 months before he got home and found out. For the moment, though, James Cook had a more immediate family to look after, his crew.
true. Peppered throughout the journals of James Cook are constant references to feeding his men. He was obsessive about their diet and small wonder. The biggest threat to their health on board was scurvy. Scurvy killed more sailors in the 18th century than war, accidents and shipwrecks combined. Scurvy is a horrible condition caused by lack of vitamin C. Nobody knows this yet, not even James Cook, but he does know his men need to eat fresh food, something impossible on long voyages. So instead, he places his faith in a substitute. Sauerkraut or pickled cabbage. Trouble is, his men refuse to eat it. And frankly, I don't blame them. It smells disgusting. But here we see something quite remarkable. James Cook could order his men to eat it. He could threaten to flog them. But instead, he chooses a different tactic. Psychology. The sauerkraut, the men at first would not eat until I put in practice a method I never once knew to fail. This was to have some of it dressed every day for the cabin table. The moment they see their superior set a value upon it, it becomes the finest stuff in the world. In all his voyages, Cook, the humanitarian, would not lose a single man to scurvy. But this voyage wasn't over yet. There were more discoveries ahead. On April the 19th, 1770, Cook sighted the land which would forge his name in history, New Holland. He guided Endeavour into a beautiful bay. You still arrive in New Holland at that very bay. It's the site of Sydney Airport. Today, New Holland is Australia. James Cook anchors Endeavour just out there. As he's being rowed to shore, he clearly has a sense of occasion. He knows the first man to step ashore will be remembered. So he turns to his wife's cousin, 17-year-old midshipman Isaac Smith, and says, Isaac, you should go first. New Holland was mind-blowing for Joseph Banks and his fellow naturalist, Dr. Solander. Everything there was so different from any other place on Earth. The scientists collected samples of 130 unknown species of plant, including one named after Banks himself, Banksia. James Cook had already named this place Stingray Harbour, but he went back to his journal and changed it to one that would become the most famous name in the land, Botany Bay. But one thing mystified Cook. There were few signs of the local inhabitants. Unlike the Tahitians or Maori, the residents of New Holland made it clear they wanted nothing to do with these white visitors. They wanted them to go away. On May the 6th, 1770, his work done at Botany Bay, Cook began working his way up the east coast of New Holland. For three months, he methodically and meticulously charted this unknown land. Cook had no way of knowing, but as he pushed up the east coast of New Holland, he was putting the entire voyage at risk. He was sailing Endeavour straight into a trap, the Great Barrier Reef. A marine minefield of treacherous coral outcrops over 1,200 miles long, the same distance as London to Moscow. James Cook drove his ship onwards. On June the 11th, 1770, 
Endeavour smashed onto the reef. There were a hundred men on board Endeavour, the charts of New Zealand and the east coast of New Holland. This was a priceless treasure ship. Water gushed in. The men threw stores, cannon overboard, anything to lighten the ship. They were 20 miles from land, their lives hanging in the balance. After more than 23 terrifying hours, they managed to float her off the reef. Endeavour limped for three days towards the coastline. James Cook watched plumes of smoke rising from the land. Smoke meant people. People only settled where they could find fresh water. James Cook pulled Endeavour in right here. By now, the place was deserted. Whoever had lit those fires was long gone. We know from his records that he beached the ship right here in this exact spot and then pulled her up onto the mud, pushed her over to repair the hole in her side. Sidney Parkinson, the ship's artist, then rode out roughly to where those boats are out there, turned around and drew the scene. What is so surprising about Cook is that he's managed all the rest of the voyage without doing this. He's managed to avoid running aground Tahiti, all the way around New Zealand, most of the way up the east coast of Australia, in and out of the Barrier Reef. Remarkable. He's making the charts as he goes, and he manages to run aground just once. That's absolutely stunning. After seven weeks, Cook navigated the patched up endeavour out through the maze of the Great Barrier Reef. 18 days later, on the 22nd of August, 1770, Cook performed one of the most controversial acts of the whole voyage. He claimed the entire east coast of New Holland for Britain. It was an act which even today some regard as the illegal theft of a continent from its indigenous people. The next day, Cook sailed north into open water and back onto the map. Endeavour had finally rejoined the known world and now headed for the Dutch port of Batavia, modern Jakarta. Endeavour was still in bad need of repair. Not long after they arrived, they took on water. But that water was infected and disease struck. It was James Cook's worst nightmare. As they sailed for home, men he'd kept alive for two and a half years began to die. March the 13th, 1771, South Africa. By now, Cook had lost over a third of his men. There were barely enough left to sail the ship into port. So close to home, having taken his crew around the world without losing a single man to disease. This was a tragedy for the man who cared so greatly for his men and devastating for someone who needed to be in control. July the 12th, 1771, after two years and 11 months at sea, Endeavour sighted the White Cliffs of Dover. Britain's great scientific voyage of discovery was finally over, and it was time for Cook to leave his wooden world on board Endeavour. James Cook headed home to Elizabeth and the family. He was expecting four children, but there were only two young James and Nathaniel. Baby Joseph had died while Cook was away, and so too had his only daughter. I've got children of my own, so the thought of Elizabeth mourning her little ones by herself really tugs at my heart. She buried two of them here at St Dunstan's Church, not far from the family home at Mile End. Baby Joseph, and her namesake, the infant Elizabeth.
canny and pragmatic, she was raised in an alehouse near the Thames, so knew what she was in for marrying a sailor. But James Cook was no ordinary sailor. In 16 years of marriage, they spent just four years together. If James Cook was exceptional, he needed a wife who was every bit as tough and determined to hold their family together. Theirs really was a partnership, despite the long years of separation. In her own way, she was just as remarkable as him. On June the 16th, 1772, Elizabeth gave birth to George, their fifth child. Just five days later, James Cook said goodbye to Elizabeth and the children. He was going to the other side of the world and he might never return. The Admiralty still believed there were huge areas in the Southern Ocean where a vast landmass might be found. But Cook had a second personal agenda, to chart the Southern Oceans and rid them of uncertainty. Now he's on a voyage that he says will make his previous discoveries more perfect and complete. More perfect and complete. That choice of words is really interesting. It gives us a valuable insight into his determination and his obsession. On 13th of July, 1772, Cook and his new ship Resolution and the Adventure sailed from Plymouth. It would take over three months to reach Table Bay at the southern tip of Africa. From here, they headed south towards Antarctica, where the ships entered a strange world of ice. Admiration and horror. The first is occasioned by the beautifulness of the picture, and the latter by the danger, and can only be described by the hand of an able painter. The able painter was 29-year-old ship's artist, William Hodges. He would show the world wonders like these, the very first images of the Antarctic. At 14 past 11 o'clock, we pass the Antarctic Circle and are undoubtedly the first and only ship that ever crossed that line. James Cook continued his sweep of the Southern Ocean. He'd been at sea for over four months and travelled over 10,000 miles without ever sighting land. something was happening to Cook, the man who always wanted to be in control, began to show glimpses that all wasn't well. He was suffering so greatly from his stomach that he was in a great sweat and could hardly stand. It was indeed hardly remarkable that, after so great a responsibility and so prodigious a strain on both his mental and physical capacities, he should be completely exhausted. And the Sparman, HMS Resolution. <laughs> Cook recovered and the vast blank which was the Pacific Ocean was now being meticulously filled in by the hand of this master chart maker. Yet the growing sense of order on the chart contrasted with the growing disorder in his temper. Increasingly unpredictable, the new Cook was at times a far cry from the controlled man his crew was used to. On this voyage, Cook had achieved his ambition, to go as far as it was possible for a man to go. But had he pushed himself too far? Physically and mentally, flaws are beginning to show in this discovering genius. Flaws that will ultimately lead to his death. The summer of 1776 finds James Cook here, ensconced at Greenwich Hospital, a retirement home for sailors. Cook was bored and restless, 
At 48, he was the most celebrated sailor of his age. He had completed two extraordinary voyages of discovery, and he was about to be called out of retirement to start a third. Cook had been asked to dinner with the three most important men in the British Navy. They wanted him to lead one final voyage of exploration. They wanted him to find the fabled Northwest Passage. And the reason was Britain's love of tea, most of which came from Asia. The main trade route to the riches of Asia was around the bottom of Africa and across the Indian Ocean. But the Portuguese had controlled that for almost 300 years. The answer was to go the other way round, over the top of the world. A passage northwest from Britain, up to the Arctic, down into the Pacific and round to China, cutting the distance almost by half. Like the great southern unknown, the Northwest Passage um, was one of those great cartographic mysteries. What happened in the northern coastline of Canada? What was there at the North Pole? From the very start of this voyage, James Cook was under enormous pressure. He only had a few months to prepare. He scoured the existing charts and accounts of previous voyages, but most of them were useless fantasies. Look at the quality of information he has to deal with. This Russian map purports to be a very accurate little map, but just look here. Alaska is shown as an island. This strait doesn't even exist, yet Cook's been sent north to sail through it and find the Northwest Passage. But there were other worrying signs that James Cook's third great voyage would have its problems. One thing he wasn't doing, something he'd always done, was to check personally the ship, the supplies and the equipment for the voyage. He's neglecting the very thing that ensured his success on his other voyages. He said farewell to Elizabeth. She knew she faced years of separation, but even she couldn't guess it would be 56 years of being alone. They would never see each other again. In June 1776, the expedition set sail. Cook used two ships, Resolution, which he'd command, and Discovery. Once again, he would travel round Africa and enter the Pacific from the east, before heading north to the Canadian coast in his search for the Northwest Passage. For some of his loyal crew, this would be their third voyage with Cook. One newcomer is ship's master, the brilliant but prickly William Bly. He'll become notorious for the mutiny on the bounty, but for now, he wants to sail with Cook the great navigator. But as the voyage progressed, Cook, the cool, humane captain, underwent a dramatic, disturbing change. He loses his temper. He starts to shout and yell at the officers and men. He starts to lose control of his emotions. And there's a, there's a kind of tragic inevitability that it's not going to end well. If his behavior was growing erratic towards the end of the second voyage, on the third, it was getting worse. Heva, the name of the dancers of the Southern Islanders, which bore so great a resemblance to the violent motions and stampings on the deck of Captain Cook, it was a common saying among both officers and people, the old boy has been tipping a heva. James Trevenon, midshipman, HMS Resolution. James Cook did have big problems. He was battling the wind and supplies were stretched to the limit. He'd also missed the northern summer, which meant extending the trip by another year. The Cook of old would have maintained his composure. This new Cook has a mean streak and he takes it out on others. The first to feel this was the island of Muria near Tahiti. When the locals stole the ship's goat, Cook got so angry he set fire to their boats and village in revenge. Thus, this troublesome and rather unfortunate affair ended, which could not be more regretted on the part of the natives than it was on mine. 
The once peaceful James Cook was now becoming increasingly ruthless with the indigenous people he met, and his crew began to notice the change. Captain Cook punished, in a manner rather unbecoming of a European, by cutting off their ears, firing at them with small shot as they were swimming or paddling to shore, beating them with the oars and sticking the boat hook into them. George Gilbert, midshipman, HMS Resolution. Cook was aware of his changing behaviour, but it seems he was unable to control it. Actually, I sometimes wonder if he just wasn't a little bit depressed, because depression wasn't a condition that one admitted to or diagnosed back in the 1700s. Another more simple explanation might be that he just wore the burden of command for too long. He was worn down by continual responsibility. Cook had been away for over 18 months when he sailed up towards the North American continent. It was from here, New Albion, that he began his search for the Northwest Passage. New Albion included what we now call Canada. Here, James Cook met the Mawachat, the people of the deer. Cook's crew were the first white men they'd ever seen. James Cook arrived in these waters. It said that the people who came out to meet him directed him to a village. And that's it over there, the village of Euquot. James Cook's ship resolution is really falling apart. Sloppy defence contractors aren't just a modern problem. The shipwrights back home have done a terrible job, and he now needs to chop down these trees to replace masts and make new timbers. All work that should have been overseen by Cook in London, not thousands of kilometres away here. After a month in Nootka, James Cook sailed off in search of the Northwest Passage. It was the start of his last great quest. Cook's ships crawled along the tortuous Alaskan coastline. Every bay and inlet was methodically checked. Any of them might have revealed the elusive route back to Britain. Weeks and months drifted by. There was no sign of Cook's prize, no sign of a quick route home. Cook should have been in his element. On previous journeys, his obsession with meticulous charting of unfamiliar coastlines had driven his crew to distraction. But now, it was doing the same to him. One huge bay alone took 16 days to explore to his satisfaction. Could it be he was starting to doubt himself? What if the Northwest Passage didn't really exist? What if this last great voyage was a waste of time? In August 1778, Resolution and Discovery entered the Arctic Ocean. The two ships beat drums and fired guns to keep track of each other. Here, James Cook entered a world shrouded in fog. The Russian maps he'd gathered in London were useless. What could induce him to publish so erroneous a map? But the most illiterate of his illiterate seafaring men would have been ashamed to put his name to. James Cook's behaviour is beginning to horrify his men. He runs with the wind in fog so thick they can barely see the length of the ship. Suddenly, he hears the sound of crashing surf and orders the ship halted. When the fog clears, they realise they've hurtled through a gap in the rocks little wider than the ship herself. Providence had conducted us through these rocks where I should not have ventured on a clear day. And to such an anchoring place, I could not have chosen better. Desperate for fresh meat, James Cook had some walrus butchered and ordered his men to eat it. They found walrus disgusting and refused. In a fit of pique, he cut their rations. 
that's completely out of character for him and shows just how badly he was losing the control, the respect of his crew. That's something that's never happened before. They now take the extraordinary step of writing him a letter of complaint. This is a very mutinous proceeding. Every innovation of mine, sauerkraut, all of them, have been designed by me to keep my people free from the dreadful distemper scurvy. James Cook's world was spiralling out of control. A ship that was falling apart, maps that were useless fantasies. He'd been at sea for a year, and after just three weeks in the Arctic Ocean, he'd hit a wall of ice, and it was not even winter yet. Now even the world's greatest explorer had to admit defeat. James Cook probably would have seen it as a failure of science, but perhaps it was a failure of the man. Perhaps he shouldn't have agreed to lead this voyage. He was almost 50. He'd spent most of the last 10 years at sea under the sort of pressure that most captains never experience. When he was younger, he seemed to thrive on this, but now it was taking its toll. Where once he led solely by example, now he would sometimes resort to using fear and threats. He was losing the respect of his crew and officers and the people he met in these new lands. With the northern winter looming, it would be months before he could search again for the Northwest Passage. He desperately needed somewhere warm to rest and resupply. So he took his two ships back to the Pacific, to a place that he discovered on his journey north, the Sandwich Islands. Today we know them as Hawaii. Amazingly, Cook sailed round them for six weeks without landing. His crew thought their commander was out of his mind. They certainly were, watching the land pass by day after day. Cook offered no explanation, and they didn't dare ask. Finally, resolution and discovery entered a wide bay and dropped anchor. You still enter Kealakakua Bay the way James Cook saw it, but the reception he received was astonishing. So many people came out and clambered aboard Resolution and Discovery that both ships started to list. I had nowhere in the course of my voyages seen so numerous a body of people assembled at one place. Besides those in canoes, all the shore were covered in spectators and many hundreds were swimming about the ships like shoals of fish. After almost three weeks, resolution and discovery resupply and leave. James Cook's going back again to hammer away at the ice of the Northwest Passage. But just a few days out of here, resolution breaks a mast. It's that shoddy workmanship he never ever saw in London coming back to haunt him. The ships have to return. This time, there was no big welcome. The Hawaiians had already given James Cook everything they had and were far from happy to see the ships return. The Hawaiians make it very plain that their patience is worn thin. The level of thefts goes up very considerably and this is a sign that the chiefs no longer are protecting him. He would outstayed his welcome. He was no longer an honoured guest, he was now a damn nuisance and relations change. It's the 14th of February, 1779. James Cook awakes to learn that during the night, one of his ship's boats has been stolen. The events of the day now move very fast. He orders the bay to be blockaded. Discovery on that side of the bay sealing it, resolution sealing the other side. James Cook has decided to pick a fight. James Cook arrives on this beach. He's armed and with nine marines. They head up towards a large village here called Ka'avaloa. It's perhaps the most sacred site on the island. He marches into this sacred village, goes straight to the chief's house and seizes him. Cook 
Jake intends to keep him hostage until he gets his boat back. James Cook brings the chief down here to the water's edge amid a gathering crowd of Hawaiians. Hundreds on this beach and more lining the rocks. To their eyes, James Cook's behavior is a huge insult. On the other side of the bay, William Bly, ever aggressive, orders his men to open fire on a canoe trying to breach the blockade. They kill a high-ranking warrior. A tidal wave of anger then sweeps along the shoreline. The beach erupts into volley of stones. James Cook himself fires the first shot, killing a man. Then the Hawaiians attack. James Cook died right here. The sailors watching helplessly as his body is hacked to pieces. But what actually killed Cook wasn't daggers or stones or drowning. It was the belief that he could control every situation. That's the tragedy of his death. In his three epic voyages, James Cook had proved himself one of the greatest explorers this world has ever seen. The empire would make him a hero but the truth about Cook the man was washed away. I think the real Cook was more complex, more fascinating, and that his personal journey was perhaps the most dramatic of them all. What I've found is perhaps an unpalatable truth, that the ambitious, decent man who saw the human in everyone, that man lost himself along the way. So a genius, yes, but a flawed and lonely genius. And perhaps that's the real reason why his wife Elizabeth burned those letters. To try to keep Captain Cook the man for herself, so that only the legend remained. We're spending a night amongst the animals here on BBC4 tomorrow. Join us for a sleepover at the zoo at nine. Next tonight, there, it's our world movie premiere, Conspiracy and Clandestine Surveillance in 80s East Germany. Drama coming up in Barbara.